on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. The whole world could essentially shut down and wow, there's a wild raw food that you can just straight up eat or cook and store. Most traditional homes you go into, they're going to have braids of team sila hanging there. You always feel good knowing you have food to offer somebody. The future of team sila, due to habitat loss, there's um, less of it on the landscape than there used to be. A prairie dog town contains much more than just the prairie dog. There's snake dens, other rodents, main food source for coyotes, birds of prey. They are a keystone species out here, and they have a deep relationship with the buffalo. The uh, Dakota name for the prairie dogs is uh, Pispiza. Literally means those that squeak. Picking off a few and having a meal with them occasionally just seems like about as fun as anything you could do. The seasonings, they were all indigenous, and so I imagine they would have been similar a long time ago, too. I just hope that some people are inspired. I hope so, too. Because there's a tremendous resource. Episode 138 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Prairie Dogs and Prairie Turnips, Food of the Plains with Travis Condon is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Do you love mushrooms? Do you know that eating mushrooms is called mycophagy? Mushrooms are, of course, a cornerstone of the wild food experience, but learning about them can be daunting. Would you like to learn to identify and harvest mushrooms, but you aren't quite sure where to start? Then it's time to check out the North American Mycological Association. The North American Mycological Association has 97 affiliate clubs across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, so there's probably a chapter near you. You can check them out at namyco.org. For a completely immersive and in-person experience, including lectures, workshops, foraging, and of course, mycophagy, you can attend their annual foray. The 2022 foray will be held in the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. Again, go to namyco.org to register. When you do, mention WildFed and you'll get a free copy of Maxine Stone's book, Missouri Wild Mushrooms, when you attend. Again, go to namyco.org to get started. The North American Mycological Association, promoting, pursuing, and advancing mycology. Hey, are you a small business owner in the wild food space or a hobbyist forager looking for a side hustle? Then listen up. This episode is brought to you by Foraged.Market, a website for buyers and sellers of wild and specialty foods from around the globe. Think Etsy, but for foods with a story. But it gets better. Not only do you get your own product page to promote your goods, they expose you to a constant stream of ideal buyers, foodies, chefs, and restaurants looking for raw ingredients or value-added products just like yours. Go over to foraged.market slash wildfed to get started. While you're there, you'll also find a coupon for $10 off your first order of any of the incredible products there from other sellers. Foraged.market. Buy there, sell there, and learn more about their incredible vision and conservation ethic by listening to episode 122 of the Wild Fed podcast. Foraged.market, the global marketplace for wild and specialty foods. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to the Wild Fed podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. You may remember that last September, I had the honor and privilege of going out to the Standing Rock Reservation in the Dakotas to harvest a buffalo, or bison for those who prefer the scientific name, for the second season of the Wild Fed TV show. Our friend Travis hosted us, showed us around, introduced us not only to the buffalo, but to the people and the Dakota culture too. He was with us for the hunt, and he and I broke that buffalo down together on the prairie. It was an incredible experience. While we were there, I was particularly taken by two other species, both traditional foods of the prairie. One that we ate, the prairie turnip, or what the Dakota and Lakota call timsala, a tuber that can be eaten raw or cooked and that when dried lasts nearly indefinitely. Folks there keep long braids of it that they make by peeling the tuber itself, which looks something like a small white potato, but leaving the tap roots on, which they plate into beautiful braids that make these vegetables easy to store, transport, and hang up as decorations until they're ready to be used. 
We had them cooked into buffalo stew, and I was so impressed by their flavor, texture, and nutritional composition that I knew I'd have to come back to experience the harvest myself. The other species was, of course, the prairie dog, a very gregarious ground squirrel that lives in enormous colonies called towns that dot the prairie landscape. These subterranean dwellers are always popping out of their burrows and standing tall on their mounds, surveying the surrounding grassy plains, which they keep mowed short to prevent hidden avenues of approach for predators that might like to dine on the prairie's most iconic small game species. Both having the prefix prairie in their common name was a coincidence that I couldn't overlook, and I spent the winter days in Maine daydreaming about going back to harvest both for a meal that would become an episode of the third season of the Wild Fed TV show. Well, it finally happened, which brings me to today's podcast, a conversation with Travis Good Bull Man Condon, myself, and Wild Fed producers Grant and Oliver, who were there filming and directing the episode. Just as before, our time on the plains was inspiring and refreshing, as the beauty of the reservation lands are almost indescribable. Big sky, tall grass undulating the wind like waves in the sea, and vistas that stretch on for a hundred miles. It was also a little poignant, too, as it's all too easy to see and feel what's been lost in the last few hundred years of westward expansion, industrialization, agriculture and urban development, and of course, the denuding of the landscape's native flora and fauna. Still, despite these insults to the land and the people, the prairie still radiates a power and strength as if it's ready to rise again, restoring itself to its former glory. Whatever the future holds, I just hope the journey and adventure of life keeps bringing me back to this incredible place and the incredible people that live there. Also, before I go, I want to give a quick shout out to Linda and Luke Black Elk, who prepared the incredible meal for the show at their annual Timsala camp, along with their son Waiwikia, Linda's sister Lisa, and Luke's mom Candace. It was a real pleasure working with you all and learning about Timsala and the harvest and preparation of this incredible plant. Wopila, thank you. Welcome to the Wild Fed Podcast, aka Grant's sweatiest podcast, aka Oliver's financial podcast, <laughs> aka Daniel and Travis's Peace Pizza podcast. Namaste. We're here in uh, Mandan, North Dakota, with our friend Travis Condon. Good to be back here with you, man. Yeah, man, it was absolutely great time, man. Glad to be here with you guys. I think listeners will remember um, from our previous episode out here where we had come out to. Uh, Harvest a bison with you on Standing Rock. Yes, sir. And, Tatanka. Uh, Tatanka. Mm-hmm. And, we're, and we're back uh, this time for, uh, well, we'll reveal in a minute. So uh, welcome back, Travis. Hey, Grant, how you doing? I'm doing good. A little sweaty, like you said. Yeah. Got good. everything squared away. Everybody here. got a good kettlebell workout while I was in here doing exercise-resistant bands because of my back injury. Uh, and uh, very excited to have Oliver Anderson here for his very first appearance on the Wild Fed podcast. Oliver, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oliver's the brilliant mind that got Wild Fed on, one of the brilliant minds that got Wild Fed onto television, and uh, he's behind the scenes for many of the shoots that we do, and uh, he is somewhat smiley about today's financial news. <laughs> <laughs> you know, gir- girding my loins, I think, would be the right way to describe it, but it's it's definitely it's entertaining to watch, for sure. For, uh, for reference, uh, today's Bitcoin price is what? Sub twenty one, correct? Yeah, or that's I think it got down to sub twenty one for sure. Yeah, oofta. Yeah, oofta. <laughs> do do your own research. It's, it's not financial advice. <laughs> so uh, when when we were out here last time for our buffalo hunt, um, you know, you kind of were pointing out the prairie dog towns to me. Yeah, and being from the east, you know, I just don't, we don't have them. So uh, right away, I was like, oh, that's a squirrel. That's a ground squirrel. I became really interested in it, and we ate prairie turnips in the last episode, but didn't harvest them, but they were they were a, a meal, so part of our meal, and I was just like, gotta do prairie dogs and prairie turnips. Yeah. And so we finally got out here to do it. And give us a little bit of background on the prairie turnip for folks who, um, just like the cultural significance uh, to the Dakota out here. Sure. So the prairie turnip in Dakota, Lakota, we call it uh, Teamsila or Timsina, and um, it flowers right now. It'll probably be flowering maybe for another two to three weeks easy, 
And so right now would have been some real busy time back in the old days for all the men, women, children. You know, I'm pretty sure mostly the women and children would have participated, you know, but I have no doubts older men would have also participated mm-hmm. and helped out. But um, you would go out and you would take a digging stick, digging stick once you recognize a turnip, and you would go down, and uh, it's like a, a tuber. It's like encased in a... Um, uh, covering if you will like a thick woody husk yeah it's a thick woody husk yeah exactly and uh what you do is is once you harvest enough of them you, you gather them together and then you take that woody husk off and underneath is like a nice starchy white um you know tuber it looks like a peeled potato when it you does take it, out of there, it does right? it looks like a little potato and then um what they would have done of course they would have ate, eaten them fresh raw right then and there when they wanted to but they would have preserved them and they would have hung them in braids they would have just how you would do any normal like hair braid, for instance. Yeah, because because at the bottom of the tuber, so the top of the, the tuber, you've got the plant coming up out of the ground because it's just a couple inches beneath the soil. But then below that are a bunch of tap roots. Tap roots, yeah, that can be braided together. Correct. Yeah, so you would take those long tap roots and then you would braid braid the bulbs together um, to pr- create a really beautiful, you know, braid of uh, that you would just hang up and it would just naturally dry, and you would make sure that. You gathered enough to last throughout the brutal winters around yeah. here, and that would have been part of your food stock. And everybody's been saying they'll last like kind of indefinitely. Yeah, they have yeah, a pretty long time, right? Yeah, I think if I recall, Linda said that she had they had found some in caves or something, you know, and several hundred years old, and right. they were still edible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and those braids are a pretty common thing to see in. Um, in yeah. So homes. so most most traditional homes you go into, they're going to have braids of team sila hanging there. Mm-hmm. And that's always, you always feel good knowing you have food to offer somebody yeah. if they come to your house. So it's like the original, you know, survival food storage. It, it is. And um, one of the things they would have done is as it was dried and we had the opportunity last time for Loretta to make us some great wojapi, mm-hmm. you know, and I uh, know... Once that tipsila, that prairie turnip is dry, you can kind of make it into a little flower and it turns into like a thickening agent right. or, you know, you could use it for other uses too. But it really, it, traditionally they put it in the wojapi to make it a little bit thicker and it just gives it a different flavor, a little bit texture. And, so, and for reference too, the wojapi is... Um, it's like a pudding, uh, berry pudding, right? Yeah, choke cherry. Usually choke cherry. Correct. Tradi- well, we made some with blueberry last night with Linda Black Elk. Yes, that was, that was cool delicious. That yeah. was delicious. Yeah, when so you, you could use the, it like... When you use the prairie turnip as a thickener do you think after you dry it do you grind it down yeah you can, yeah exactly however they would a you know a mortar pestle type deal mm-hmm, yeah. or just like uh the mono matate that we yeah, were talking exactly, about exactly yeah they would have they would have had ways to grind their food down for sure the uh neat thing too is how the braids go from the thickest biggest turnips down to the smallest littlest ones and i didn't realize till this time out that the little ones were more desirable to eat. Yeah. And I think uh, you were saying that a lot of times, especially for the elders who's may, who maybe they don't have as their, their teeth aren't as intact or as uh, structurally sound. So the smaller ones are a little bit more tender and softer to eat. So you were saying if, you know, you sort of give those to, to or to guests, like you cut the little ones off the bottom of the, the, the braid you sort of, for your family, you know, maybe eat the bigger ones. Yeah, you would give them the most tender if you will. You always want yeah. to give your guests the most, the best yeah. part of your food if you can. That's kind of, that's a traditional teaching. And um, the bigger, because there's some pretty bu- big bulbs out there. And I find that those get almost like a really woody, tough texture. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. fibrous. Much more fiber in them. Yeah, exactly. Versus the nice little tender ones. That, yeah, those are great. I mean, those yeah. a lot of people just, they'll eat those right raw, right yeah. there and there. So. Yeah, I was noticing... Um, that uh, Luke Black Elk's mom, well, because we sat there yesterday and you know peeled out pounds and pounds, yeah. of them, and she just was there snacking on them raw. I thought that was cool. Yeah, um, Grant and Oliver, I'd be curious to hear you guys' tasting notes. And I know uh, last year, Oliver, you weren't like a huge fan of the uh, Tim Sula, like not your favorite food ever. Well, yeah, I mean, and me and Grant definitely have very differing opinions on this. <laughs> Oliver was like, yeah, you can eat them whole if you like microwaved golf balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just like, I mean, for people who haven't tried it, it's just like a very, um, it's sort of fibrous and there isn't a, a really, it's got an earthy flavor, but it doesn't have like a, like a flavor I'm used to like more with my tr- in a traditional Western palate mm-hmm. and like a, a big one is like kind of a, to me, it was like a little bland and it was like 
a little little chewy. Mm-hmm. Um, but now that said, last year we ate it in a in a meal that was fairly unflavored as we were going for like yeah, a super basically tradition. just salt. Yeah, yeah, just salt. But um, we cut it thin this time, mm-hmm. much to Grant's chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> I still liked it, but something about the whole vegetable that I liked too. I I like I loved it this time because it just both sides get coated with the flavors mm-hmm. of the dish yeah, yeah. and it it just becomes something that's like a little bit more manageable scale wise it's it's the same sort of scale so as you have like a big mouthful yeah. of just yeah. the turnip yeah it's the same scale as every other bite that you're having so i think just as like a just for eating it was just a little bit easier and it was it really added a lot at this time i, I loved it i feel like i just need to interject because Oliver. i just don't want the listener to get the wrong idea because oliver you're extremely well traveled and you've you probably you you know you've you've got your wife's Korean so yeah. you've eaten some pretty exotic food by a sure, Western yeah. palate standard. Sure, yeah. Like yeah. you were talking about eating live octopus the other day and stuff like that. So it's like it's not like you're um, you're not one of these people who's like, oh, I only eat yeah. you know, oh, chicken uh, breast, yeah, chicken and fingers, and uh, <laughs> yeah. French fries. No, no. But I mean, I'm I'm still like my palate's still developing. Like I'm yeah. still learning, and especially as we come out here, we're encountering I'm encountering flavors and traditions that I'm not familiar with so you, it takes time it takes time to adjust and yeah. i'm i'm honest about what you know yeah, you guys yeah. know i'm Appreciate honest it. about what i like to eat we've eaten a lot of a lot of things on this show and <laughs> <laughs> there's some things i'm i'll i'll give it to you straight i'll be like i didn't like putting that in my mouth <laughs> <laughs> cicadas come to mind yeah grant though is like the weirder the better yeah that i know because yeah. yesterday you were like Ah, oh, you know, I like them, but I like the tints of the whole. And, yeah, and Oliver's like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? Do you like them whole better or cut well, up? Well, I want to like hear what you, thought, what, what you think first. Yeah, I think the same. It's obviously more approachable when it's cut up thin like that. You get a little bit of each ingredient in, in the bite, so mm-hmm. like you can experience the whole meal better that way. It's like, but the way Loretta did, it was just something nice about... It was my first time having prairie turnip, too, so it's kind of like the raw experience. Yeah, you full know? experience. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about them whole where um, texturally there's – I want to relate them to potato because it's easy to, mm-hmm. but there's something almost like mushroom-like about them too. There's like something oh, yeah, a little bit – I don't know how there's to describe fi- They're fibrous a little bit, yeah. right? Like, yeah, they've got some chew yeah, to them. Yeah. Um, anyway, but cut thin like that in the dish was, was really nice. You know what the raw texture is kind of like? It's like a sprouted coconut. Yeah. You know? it's, it's like that spongy. A little bit of a foaminess yeah. almost around the fibers. Yeah. To me, they're just this incredible food. Like I, I was blown away. But what was funny was when we walked out, Linda and Luke were, you know, taking us around to their prairie turnip spots, and yeah. and uh, they had some shovels there. And initially, I was thinking like a small spade would be fine. I was like, oh, people did this with digging sticks. So I was thinking of one of those like little three foot spades with a short little wooden handle. And now I know that would have just broke immediately. Mm-hmm. They had <clears throat> full size, you know, spades that had metal handles, and and those were could really hold up against that soil. So they kept saying something like, um, you know, prairie turnips can hide from you if you come out here with the wrong energy or the wrong kind of spirit about it. And, uh, you know, they were saying things like that. And then, you know, sort of given the idea that, like, you got to have the right approach. And so the very first prairie turnip I went to dig, I stuck that spade in the ground, pulled back, and my lower back just went like, click. And I was like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. And I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want them to be like, Oh, what was in your heart when you did, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you feel, is this not, this is an opportunity. Do you feel like you approach that prairie turn up with malintent? Yeah, I like don't, I do not think no, that. We actually said, a, we said our own little prayer. Before yeah, we, started. we had tobacco right. and everything. Yeah. 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 I think, no, I think that I just had, I was expecting the soil to just give and pop and it was like cement. It just yeah. didn't move. And my back was the thing that moved before the, the soil moved. It, it just makes you appreciate, uh, again, how we talked about with the Buffalo episode, you know, the, the women of old is just how strong they must have been digging with the digging stick and then yeah. making sure, you know. So so one plant with a shovel literally takes us two minutes. Not know? even that. Not I even mean, that, you probably, yeah. yeah, when you're good at it, I'd, less than a minute probably. Yeah, absolutely. So then when you get a digging stick involved with that hard, tough soil like you're yeah. talking about, I mean, that's a workout. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that'll be no easy feat. Right. I was reading antler was a preferred material. Sure. You know, you could imagine it. Because also the wood resources out here are pretty limited, right? Like, Yeah, but they would have still, I mean, that's, it's having, it kind of would have been part of their toolkit. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? So they would have definitely carried 
a good stick from them because it sure. was probably fire hardened or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. they even had engravings and their own yeah, personal sure. sticks, et cetera. Well, it's a really cool food. So, and I liked how we were harvesting. It's like you'd, you'd pull back on the shovel, reveal the, the tuber, yep. pop that out of the ground, put that soil back down and leave the plant in place because the plant's gone to seed, but the seeds weren't mature. And they were saying the seeds will continue to mature even without that tuber so that you, you know, continue to proliferate the plant. So, and really they're good. actually quite plentiful, right? How Luke and Linda were talking about, they can hide from you. Mm. Be, but it's almost like um, maybe that particular one wanted to hide from you. But, I mean, their their yeah. relatives are everywhere, man. Yeah. They're all, once you kind of, you see one, you recognize one, and then it's mm-hmm. like you instantly know, recognize the next one. And they also, it's said that they point to each other. You know, that their leaves and their flowers will kind of point to their Because yeah, they kind of nod over to a side a little bit. Yeah, so, and, and they are... Like Linda and Luke were talking about, I mean, they're they're like they're they're a family, you know what I mean? They're their own spirit, etc. Mm-hmm. So they they don't. It's almost like they're ratting each other out, but <laughs> but but maybe it's to, for the for the good of the people. Yeah, because now there's, you know, the the future of Timsla is not. I wouldn't say they're in peril, but they're certainly due to habitat loss, particularly from farming and ranching and development. There's um, less of it on the landscape than there used to be. Right. And so it seems like people having a food relationship with it's one of the things that will ensure that it's perpetuated in perpetuity. I agree. I think so, yeah. too. I think so. I think I think the more people you can get to appreciate this food, the more you're probably going to see it yeah. you know, reemerge. Or people do prairie restoration and they, yeah, want, they, want, to put it they in. want this back in there. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say that uh, for the traditional people here, it's a... It, it occurs to me it's probably in the top five most important foods. Oh, would you e- say? absolutely. Because you got the choke cherry, the buffalo, yeah, the, the tinsula. Absolutely. I mean, what else it even kind of is in that category? I would say similar to the choke cherry, in the sense that it's um, like an old faithful. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They're they're there just about every year. Yeah. You know, and so. It's definitely, I would say, like, top three for sure. Yeah, wow. Absolutely. Yeah, they're cool food, and we're going home with a little bit, so that's exciting. Yeah. Being out on the prairie, obviously, the prairie dogs kind of dominate so much of the landscape. And uh, right away, you know, you just are hearing from ranchers. It's like, ah, oh, damn prairie dogs. Right. And I think Davey, who hosted us on his land, said that it drops his property value like 500 bucks an acre, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, there's that. <clears throat> there's obviously, like, pretty widespread poisoning. Yeah. People try to reduce their numbers um, and just generally see them not just as a pest, but it's kind of like people seem to be, like, almost grossed out by them. What's bit. the main reason that the ranchers don't like them? The, I think because they're excavating so much of their landscape and probably makes it difficult to work. And they're eating the They're and eating so. any kind of grass so thin, too, right? So right. it's like the, the double whammy of their taking the – because they, they use – the land for hay, right, or whatever the case may be, grazing, etc. Oh yeah, and they can't grow the grass. Yeah, up so in the, there. so the the prairie dogs are eating all the grass in their towns, and so that if you recall, you know, it's almost kind of like barren, you know, maybe a half inch grass, but a lot of dirt, etc. So yeah, um, they but they chew all that grass down, obviously partially because they got to eat something, but also to make it so it's difficult for predators correct. to approach. Yeah. And then, and then, but they just proliferate so much. So they're not just going to stay in their little acre. They're going to continue to reproduce and move. And next thing you know, they're covering a thousand acres. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and all those mounds, they're, they're mounds with holes in the top of them. So the cattle break their legs in those? Uh, sometimes, sometimes they'll get hurt. Um, I think more so because the cattle will stay put at night and, you know, more so probably if they're on a run or if something spooks them, and it could easily happen. I know, I know it happens to buffalo also. I think the biggest risk is probably the camera guys breaking there. Yeah, a couple, <laughs> I, couple I, I definitely worry. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely almost uh, put a leg in there walking backwards trying to track you guys on this hunt. I mean, why don't we talk about that? I mean, that we obviously hunted them. Yeah, and. Yeah. We had to, I mean, I saw you guys had to really do some, some gaming out. Like, how are we going to get close? We thought we came in really confident, right? Well, we it thought, seems easy. You're just yeah. looking at a thousand of them looking at you, you know? Yeah. But to, then, uh, to, to go back real quick to what we're talking about in regards to being pests, hmm. so a lot of people, a lot of ranchers will let hunters, you know, quote-unquote hunters, you know, with their long-range rifles and their big old scopes, you know, sit 
you know, three, four, five, six hundred yards away, and they're just popping off prairie dogs as they as they come out, you know, or as they're running across. And it's target it, practice. Yeah, it's pretty much target practice for for a lot of the. And you know, again, like the ranchers, they they're considered pests to many many ranchers. So they'll they'll be like, yeah, come on out. Even Davey's like, yeah, come on anytime you want. I got you know. Yeah, the day before they, we hunted, they had a big prairie dog hunt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is what's funny about that to me is that. Because you know, for clarity, they're not—they're not shooting them for food. They're just shooting them as pest elimination. But there's not any real chance of any kind of control from that. That's just probably more of like a vindictive thing, because, yeah. or a fun target practicing thing. Because it's not like you're going to go out there and uh, you know the cost of good ammunition Around, yeah. to a to a, for a long range rifle these days a couple bucks. So it's not like you're. You're going to go out there and shoot 30,000 prairie dogs. Right. You're going to shoot maybe four or five and you're done or whatever, you know, maybe 20 if you were good. It but. seems like a species that you're just not going to eradicate. I mean, they mentioned that they were poisoning some of them. And then when we drove back yesterday to give Davey the soup, they were just, there were so many of them popping the their heads up. Yeah, poisoned. where they said they were poisoning them. So I just feel like it's one of those species that you're never going to get rid of. Yeah, nor should you. So that's the other thing is they are a keystone species out here and, and they have a deep relationship with the buffalo, right? So Correct, it's like, yeah. Yeah, so as far as, um, I mean, a prairie dog town contains much more than just a prairie dog, right? So there's, you know, snake dens, there's all other rodents. Right. Um, the it the coyotes I believe the prairie dog is the main food source for coyotes, mm-hmm. um, you know birds of prey, uh, etc. And then something about I don't know if there's like aeration or something, but yeah, the it, giant the, earthworms. Yeah, so exactly. It's so it's it's like the in how we saw at Davy's place. It's like off of the prairie dog towns, the grass is just growing great. You yeah, know what I mean it's so maybe that's why. The, there's that connection with the buffalo, you yeah. know, they just know that the prairie dogs have great grass around them, you know. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to to c- figure out how to get in there and get close enough to them because our mission was we want to eat them. And again, as I said, they are squirrels, you know, so I don't like this idea of the, it was like dogs, the dog town. It's like, I, it's like. It's Squirrel Town. <laughs> that just sounds more like food to me. Squirrel Town. But to me, when I think squirrel, I think food, which I know is also not most people's. I think initially, I remember Oliver when, when we first talked about eating squirrels. You were like, "Wife's not going to like that." Well, my pet name for my wife is my squirrel. <laughs> she really, she really likes squirrels. I kept it a secret from her for a long time, <laughs> but she she knows now, and and. Uh, you know, it's an open marriage. We brought squirrels in. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I talked to her after, you know, after we ate them. And I said, it was like, just, you know, just so you know, it's a, it's a giant squirrel, basically. <laughs> and she was like, they, they look really cute. And I was like, they do. And they're delicious. <laughs> so, you know, there's that too. <laughs> yeah, so this I was thinking... You know, first we had to find a spot where there hadn't been poisoned and, you know, any yeah. kind of recent history. And then uh, so that wasn't too hard because they, they were everywhere. And then uh, and then it was like, how do we get close enough to take shots with low caliber rifles? So, so we could preserve that So we meat. could preserve the yeah. meat, right. Because obviously, a, you know, a rifle that would allow us to shoot them out from hundreds of yards away is likely going to do tremendous damage and we're going to lose the meat. And so, you know, and you might think too, like, okay, you blow the top half off, but you still got the bottom half. But... With all that hydrostatic shock, blood just gets, like, pressed into places. You get bruising all over the body, you know, outside of the wound channel and stuff. So so we wanted to get close. And uh, it's not like you can just walk out there and start shooting them with a twenty two, right? Yeah. It wasn't that simple. Yeah. So, yeah, we thought we were just going to hang out in a little bit of the tall grass on the edge and just let them pop up and pop out. And we were just going to be picking them off, you know. But we got humbled that first Mm-hmm. Hour, the first it's morning, like they know yeah. how far the 22 can shoot <laughs> i feel like that with turkeys too like when i'm chasing turkeys they are always they it's like this thing where you can't close distance like once they know you're there you can't get inside 30 yards from them and it was like that it was like they stayed at about 100 to 150 yards and any of the mounds in front of us they and just, we were we were sighted in for like fifty to sixty yards. Yeah, you know, it, so. it was just yeah, and you know what's the what's the terminal ballistics on a twenty two at a hundred yards? Not that good, right? You know? it's and like a little bit of wind out there, but a little bit of wind involved. The wind was a major factor. Yeah. This prairie wind was moving those those bullets around. Um, did it occur to anyone this week that whack a mole is definitely not based on moles? It's based on prairie dogs. Totally. <laughs> yeah, 
Because right. it's like, I mean, moles don't live like in these huge colonies like that. And these are, t- when they say prairie dog town, they, they mean it. It's a town. And I felt like what happened was we we stepped into a neighborhood and started shooting. And if you did that in a human neighborhood, it, everybody would know and everybody would tell everybody. And pretty quick, no one would be out. And yeah. it was like that. It was like once they started passing the message. But there was like the neighbor's. You know, yeah, like the neighborhood over blocks like, hey, away. I heard something's happening over there. They're, yeah, they're like, <laughs> yeah. That brings up the whole language thing that they have. Theories have been proposed that they have a pretty sophisticated language and communication system, which seems obvious when you're out there. What I read was that they have specific language for what kind of predator, how big the predator is, how fast the predator's moving, um, and probably whether it's, it's avian or terrestrial. We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, you've got to try the new naturally flavored colostrum from Sir Thrival. Chocolate with real cacao, vanilla with real vanilla extract, strawberry with real strawberry juice. I've been using colostrum daily and promoting it as a powerful nutritional supplement for over 15 years. In fact, I just had a quarter cup in my blended drink this morning and again this afternoon. With its ability to fortify your immune system, nourish and rebuild your gut lining, repair injuries, aid in muscle growth and recovery, and so much more, I think it's one of the most sophisticated food-based supplements we can include in our diet. Sir Thrival is already known as the number one source for premium colostrum, and now they've just released three new formulas, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. They're lightly sweetened with monk fruit and combined with MCT oil to make them more soluble in water and in blended drinks, all while having the same potency as Sir Thrival's original colostrum. They're so good, I keep eating them by the spoonful right out of the tub. Eaten like that, they're like a powdered ice cream, but of course, they make excellent blended drinks too. Again, these aren't those over-the-top fake flavors you taste in so many supplements today. These are flavored with real cacao, vanilla, and strawberry, so they taste great and really clean, too. Go to SirThrival.com to see the entire lineup of health-promoting supplements and superfoods and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? Now, back to the show. Even when we were out there, like you could hear different you know, the different languages being spoken. Definitely different words, different calls. And then it's kind of funny, like, so sometimes you can't see them, but there's this, they're underground doing something. It's almost like, it was like a, uh, some kind of subterranean sound that, and I wonder what, what exactly was going on there, you know, as far as, because it wasn't like a chirp or a squeal, it was almost like a humming or Mm -hmm. it was like a... Like a gut, yeah. It was a strange was sound, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then and then just it, just so the audience knows, a prairie dog is not in the room. With us right <laughs> that that was Grant. Well, there there I are some just, prairie dogs in the room, but they're quartered up and frozen. So it's true. <laughs> I don't know if that counts. Yeah. So when we first went out, it was like we wore three D ghillie suit tops. Well, uh, Oliver was the full. He was the full ghillie yeti. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grant shows up with a ghillie pants and a hood and no ghillie shirt. Never done that one before. It's so funny. I, and, and I'm I, missing my midsection. <laughs> yeah, people are probably going to make fun of us for that, but it's hard. We're four people, two cameras, yeah, yeah. two shooters trying to walk out into this prairie dog town where there's no cover except a little bit of grass here and there. Yeah. It, it was, I think it was, you know, a good effort. Yeah. It was you know, a good it, effort. yeah, it was, yeah. and it was fun. It was like, you're kind of like, a, you're pretending to be a sniper. Yeah. We were bit, sniping. You know? So we, our first idea was like, okay, we'll, what we ended up doing was just walk out, like standing, not even trying to crouch or anything. We just walked out, and then they all hid, and then we laid down, thinking, okay, they'll start coming up, and they won't expect us to be laid down like right, that. Right, right. We were just going to blend in with the right. environment. And you, you were know? like, you were like, Daniel, let's like wait twenty minutes, let it cool off. I was like, yeah, good idea. And then as soon as one popped up, I was like, Travis, I'm going to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> like no. Restraint. And then the moment, so I, I actually had some in my sights while you, while you took that shot. And the moment they heard that shot, boom, they oh, jumped right back in their hole, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was, was kind of frustrating, but you could see through your scope, you know, 200 yards away. They're and, all, yeah, they're all like, yeah, they're all just standing right up yeah. on the mounds. Yeah. That's great. Oliver, you were like, uh, you had a strategy. You were like, you know what, Daniel, just go do your thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I just wanted you, like, shooting a television show while hunting is just makes it ten times harder. Mm-hmm. Because cam- camera guys are, 
not the stealthiest of people. And I say that as a camera guy. <laughs> Grant, Grant's very stealthy, but I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know about that. look, I'm like the guy from Brooklyn who's just like sort of falling into prairie dog holes while you're trying to sneak up. So, you know, and I have a big tripod with a huge, huge tripod, biggest Sometimes, lens. Yeah. yeah. Big so white lens on it. I, I just knew, look, we have, we always, we come out here, we have the pressure of, we do have to cook a meal. Like it's not faked for TV. Like we have a limited amount of time to come out here. We feel the pressure of like, we need to get this protein because in, f- in 24 hours, like we need to put something in a pot and make something beautiful. So just getting that first protein mm-hmm. just takes, takes the weight off of everybody and i just knew that i was like let's keep the cameras back go out get get a prairie dog figure out your method and then once we have one we'll be like you Mm -hmm. know and that's what you went out and did right gave you a little space you went out yes after our first little initial you know foray out into the town there which is totally unsuccessful we were unsuccessful and we're kind of like we kind of decided to go back and uh to the vehicle plus we needed more ammo yeah yeah Yeah, because it was like i i came out i think you you and i each had 40 rounds i only had 30 30 rounds so we had 30 yeah that's right we had 30 rounds a piece i was like plenty of rounds like if i'm going squirrel hunting 30 rounds is i mean i might miss a couple shots but i'm gonna get my squirrels usually one to three rounds per squirrel. This was a lot of shooting. Is is this the most ammo intensive episode that we've ever done? I think so. Yeah, it's what else be. would be? It's yeah. We be. did a lot of shots. I mean, I would say I easily probably did a hundred rounds. Yeah, we shot a ton. Easy. I mean, it's not. Yeah, that's that. And a lot of times, it's not because you're just missing. Sometimes it's because you're having to walk your rounds in because with that amount of wind. You're trying to, you're like watching where the splash is. So your round hits the ground. You're like, and, and it was cool to have like, you guys were able to call it through the cameras. So, you know, like Grant, a lot of times you'd be like, that was high to the right. And then yeah, I sort of cool. like Kentucky winded you in. And uh, you ever heard that term Kentucky winded? You know what no, means? I heard it for the so, first time. So what it means is yeah. basically like when you're doing the sniper level, you know, marksmanship, that like high level marksmanship, long range shooting, you can make clicks and adjustments that um, move your crosshairs inside. So so what you're doing is like, um, okay, that's 400 yards. I got to come up two clicks. Cool. And then it's like, oh, the wind's blowing 15 miles to the east. I got to make a windage adjustment. Click, click, click. And that moves the crosshairs. Mm. But Kentucky windage is more like, she's hitting four yards to the left. And you just kind of estimate it over, which is gotcha. what we were doing. So, you know, a couple of the shots I can really distinctly remember, like, miss. Oh, okay, make an adjustment. Miss again. And he's just still standing there. And miss again. And then it's like, thunk. You get that hit, you know, or they or they duck down in because one of the rounds freaks them out. Yeah, surprise. They stay still surprisingly. Like sometimes, away. sometimes. Yeah. I mean, after you take a shot, a big puff of dust right in front of them. They're like, huh. hard to tell though, through the that compression way. of the lenses how True. close those those splashes are. Like maybe yeah, well, they're twenty feet away yeah. and they don't think anything of it. But yeah, because those telephoto lens compress everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we were once we came back after that break. I mean, it was literally like five minutes and you know you got the first and then about 10 minutes later i got the next and yeah then, and yeah, then we the, kind of both had a rhythm right we sort yeah, of split off yeah. and it made more sense it seemed like to just skirt the edges and you just try to get any shots you can at the ones that are close yeah. and then there's none and then you push in further to the ones that'll let you get close again yeah. and just keep walking it like that right it was fun it was fun it was yeah. really fun i feel like without camera guys if you guys put on ghillie suits and just slunked around be much that would be effective. a way more fun hunt yeah, mm-hmm. much more effective, obviously. Yeah, and then we did, we did, unfortunately, get, you know, more than we, uh, but they got shot at, but they went right back into their hole, mm-hmm. and we just couldn't retrieve them after that. Yeah, those There's, holes are deep, right? Very deep, yeah. Like, even, yeah, we'd shine a high-powered flashlight down in there, and it's not like you can see down in that burrow. It's just the hole just disappears down yeah. into the ground, and some of them you know, it'd leave like a blood trail going down in there and you're just like, Oh God, it's like everything from the practical to the ethical. It's like challenging, but you're like, that's just how, that's just how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Those deep holes, they have actually like, it's a literal town you were saying, right? There's like, like burrows. (laughs) There's like a, there's a town, a village. Oh, it goes, uh, so prairie dark, prairie dog towns are broken up into wards and then the wards are broken up, broken up into coteries. And the coteries are, are like the fundamental family group kind of from what I was reading, which are, I, f- I forget the scientific term for this, where it's like, 
it's four, three to four females to a male plus pups. So um, it's some kind of harem. They call it like a poly something harem. Anyway. Um, so then there's little stores down there too. And <laughs> I mean, they con- sit on rocking chairs reading books. <laughs> yeah. If anybody hasn't written a book about a children's book about prairie, prairie dog dogs, towns, they got to. Well, you know, sometimes we've, we've been out fishing and, and um, I'll, say something like, man, I, w- I wish for a second all the water could just disappear and you yeah. could just see what the bottom terrain was like and where all the fish are, are positioned, you know? Um, similarly, it's like, I wish this ground could be transparent and I could see what it's like under there because it's kind of a mystery. Yeah, just tunnels, just tunnels and yeah. tunnels everywhere, I can imagine. Yeah. You know, and then you kind of go into, like, they must have, like, their grand room, you yeah. know, or whatever, you know, <laughs> right, their, right. their family unit and be like, oh, let's yeah. go, you know. And I was reading the about the latrines in there, you know, like they dig big latrines underground, they fill them up. Once they start to fill, they dig a new one. So they've got all that figured out. And and one thing I was reading is they don't really hibernate, but they go into a torpor um, in the wintertime. So they're they're in a pretty deep sleep, metabolic, you know, reduced sleep. But um, but they're active all winter, it sounds like. They're, they're just remarkable animals, I think mm-hmm. so. What do they eat? Mostly Gra- grass. Yeah, mostly grass. Some uh, roots and tubers, I yeah. believe, too. Do they eat prairie turnips? They probably do. Well, I think we were talking about that with Linda and Luke, how we didn't see any in the vicinity, and Luke had made a comment that they probably ate them. But yeah, because it does say, you know, from what I've read, they do eat a lot of tubers. My impression was they ate the tubers from, uh, I guess I'm wondering, are they eating them while they're underground? Are they getting access assume, to them from underground? Or are they getting them from the top? Because it's not I, I like I would think the like, top, right? I would think that they're yeah. eating just like the grass. They're eating the top. So I don't know if they're getting the prairie turnip. That's a great question. Yeah. Their claws, you know, so when I picked them up, I felt like I was holding something that was an amalgamation of a tree squirrel and a groundhog. It's like if you mixed a squirrel and a groundhog together, you'd get about the right size, about mm-hmm. the right body shape. But what really stood out to me was their claws looked like miniature grizzly bear claws. And and from what I've read, grizzly claws, which are so different than, than polar bear and black bear claws, you know, they're those long ones, are because grizzly bears do a lot of digging. Brown bears do a lot of digging for, for tubers and roots and stuff. And you had the same adaptation, like convergent evolution. They had like the same kind of miniaturized yeah, long they're, claws. They're very impressive little uh, little hands they yeah, got there. <laughs> sure are, man. So yeah, you know, I know they can dig. And back to those mounds, you guys probably noticed some were big mounds that looked like some little like, volcanoes or something. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking of like uh, grade school, like right. uh, science fair, you build the volcano, it looks like that. And then some were more like uh, crater t- shape or dome shaped. And then some are just holes with nothing around them. Those are the most dangerous ones for you yeah, guys probably, day. huh? Yeah. Did you yeah. step in any? I watched you. Remember that yeah, one? You put yeah, your foot in, but you recovered. I, I you like almost stumbled out. out. I mean, I didn't hurt myself, but I've, you know, I'm backpedaling, you know, right. walking backwards. I'm staring into, staring view into your viewfinders. Yeah. That's the like, thing. Yeah. I definitely, you know, could easily tripped break over an them. ankle. Easy. Yeah. Put my foot in them. Yeah. I could, it could have been bad. We got, you know, but we made it out. Okay. Yeah. I, I spent a, big part of the the day we hunted and when we got back i spent a big part of that evening apologizing to grant over and over again for being such an asshole to him because at one point it's like i've got a prairie dog in my crosshairs and i'm like grant 12 o'clock past that brown mound and he's trying to find it in the telephoto lens which as you know is very challenging very hard but i'm like it's come on devil. dude let's go i'm starting to be like kind <laughs> yeah. of getting annoyed you know because i'm like want to shoot i'm like grant he's not gonna be here all day he's moving you'd be like that one with uh, that's laying down, yeah, he's laying down on the dark mound. No, not that one. <laughs> or it's like dark mound. Yeah, he's facing to the right. No, he's facing to the left. <laughs> yeah, God. a lot of that. I'd be like, just look over my muzzle. <laughs> but what would happen is if if there was even a couple of degrees sure, of difference yeah. between what I was looking at and you were looking at, we're looking at that distance yeah. in totally different. Places. I just started putting the the one leg of the tripod right in between Daniel's legs when he was laying prone. So we just had the same exact line of sight. That's so smart. I mean, that's actually, you guys, you guys figured it out, but yeah, you were your own little dysfunctional sniper. (laughs) (laughs) And then then I, like, my tensions got high at first. And then I finally found that first one and I was like, okay, shoot. And Daniel missed. And I was like, yes, (laughs) (laughs) I could feel that. Cause I was like, I was like, grumble, grumble. (laughs) The, uh, at one point, Davey loaned me his 17 HMR, which is this caliber I've, um, for the geeks out there, it's a, a 22 Magnum cartridge that's been necked down to hold a 17 caliber bullet. It's very light 
bullet very fast. And unlike, it is a rimfire cartridge, but other, unlike most rimfire cartridges, it's got that spitzer type bullet that looks like a little pointy rifle bullet. Very light, but man, is that thing f- fast and it has a flat trajectory. And uh, then I got, so then you walked off kind of slinking around hunting. Like, in the way that I get the impression after hunting with you a couple times is your preferred way to hunt. It's like stalking through the hills. Yeah, right? I, I enjoy that. Yep. Yeah, I could just see you off. I was like, he's in his happy place. <laughs> and I was like laying prone and just taking the, trying to take the longest shots I could get on a gun that I didn't. I, I, Davey was flying the Marine Corps flag, so I was like, Semper Fi, he's a Marine. He's, yeah. he's, they have a very high marksmanship standard. Um, like in the Marine Corps, I, th- I think compared to a lot of other branches, like everybody learns to shoot, and uh, they really pride themselves on that. So I was like, he said it was zero to 100. I was like, eh, can't be that far off, you know? That made me feel pretty confident. Um, but that bullet's moved a lot by the wind, so I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to figure that gun out. Yeah, and, and I, I still had the 20, I still had a 22, so I was still trying to get, you know, that. 50 yard shot, yeah, yeah, close yep. to him with a camera. But you both got him. Yeah, I mean, you came back. You got a handful. It was of, fun. It was uh, fun. I was, I was trying to sneak up on a prairie dog. He he was up, had him in sight. I was just, I need to go a little bit more. I got in sight and I had my scope on him, and I boom, he disappeared. I was like, shit. I look, there's Oliver trying to get a better, you know, <laughs> he's trying to get a better view. He's like trudging up the hill over that's, here. Like, that's oh. Hollywood, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's challenging hunting with camera crew for sure. Yeah. It's very, it's very hard. But I mean, we, you guys were, it was a successful hunt. Yeah, it was great. And we got incredible footage. I mean, mm-hmm. North Dakota, I've been out here many times. I love to film here. This is just the most beautiful landscape The you know, it's so flat. The s- sunset just lasts forever. We call it magic hour. Yeah. And it kind of appears beautiful. flat. It's not like parts of it aren't like real. There's yeah. Yeah, a it's lot beauty. of it. This is beauty. Those but, buttes. Um, yeah. I mean, the light is gorgeous out here. Mm-hmm. So. Oliver kept saying stuff like, just point your lens somewhere. You're going to get a great shot. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Not. I, I kind of feel that um, the clouds. So I really love where we live in the Northeast because it's so green and lush and soft. And, and you just get this feeling like the landscape's very inviting. And then I love Arizona and the Southwest because I love to see the Earth's geology not covered by all that biomass. And so you get to see sort of the beauty of of the minerality of Mm -hmm. the Earth. And what I like about here is you've got these places where you see all of that mineral structure, you know, like that bad land kind of looking stuff. But then everything's covered in a soft layer of beautiful green grass. So it looks very inviting and very hospitable. Whereas Arizona, you look at it, you're like, man, this is some hard living out here. And I love the, my favorite part of the Dakotas is the river bottoms, yeah. you know, with the, the cottonwood. cottonwood trees and just, it's just my favorite environment. Yeah. This yeah. is a beautiful place and the, the unique suite of foods here, uh, you know, from a wild food perspective, um, prairie turnip for instance that you can eat that thing raw that it's somewhere between the size of i guess some are like the size of your pinky and some are the size of a goose egg Mm -hmm. and you can eat that raw you know again like outside of like the culinary like you know taste bud perspective of whether or not you love them or don't love them it's like if you had to live off the land out here wow there's a raw food a wild raw food that you can just straight up eat or cook and store you got the choke cherries in just ridiculous abundance. I mean, even in your backyard, oh, Travis. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's, where, that's where I do all my – yeah. I don't and, have to go far for foraging for choke cherries, that's for sure. Yeah, and where you, where we live, they're a much smaller tree. Okay. Here, they're much more substantial. And um, and that – and then the buffalo, it's like well, – and the, and the prairie dog. I yeah. mean, yeah. Like, like we were talking – like it's it was kind of harder, I think, to shoot them than – how they used to do it back in the day, which yeah. was to set traps. Yeah, snares. snares, right? You can, yeah, you just set a snare right over the top of the prairie dog mound, you know, into their hole, and eventually, you you know, you're going to get them. I right. wonder what, I, w- I would love to know, I wonder maybe Tom has some memories of that or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I plan on talking to him. Well, you know, because I know he used to, um, he said his family used to eat them when he was young too, so I'd really like to see how they do Because one question I have is, so, you, so what I initially think is maybe what I would do is, is put some sticks around one of the holes that could hold the snare because they kind of come vertically right up out of that hole. But then you'd need to anchor that snare to something so they don't just drag the snare back down into True. the ground. So you got to have to drive uh, a so stake down like into the ground. Once they pop up, they're caught. That's what tighten, I would. That's what that's what occurs once. to me. But maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you just set snares around so they get out. But it'd be hard to predict where they're going to go. Right. 
But it seems like you'd want to snare him coming out of the holes. You We've got to bring Randy out here see what he would do. Oh, just <laughs> yeah. the code of the trapper. <laughs> but it seems to me you could set, what, 10 to 20 snares in a prairie dog town. Oh, just yeah. come back the next morning and right. you're going to have a meal. 20 prairie dogs, <laughs> yeah, probably, right? man. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, Grant. Like they they look like they would be because I was thinking with Davey, you know, these this this time in history right now, you know, where food security is this thing that that even regular people think more about and all that. And I just was thinking like the whole world could could essentially shut down, and if you owned property like he does with prairie dogs, you could eat every single day. And as we found, like one or two prairie dogs is plenty. Like we shot eight. We brought him out for a meal between what so seven long? people, yeah, and we couldn't even eat half of them. Yeah, yeah, that's impressive. That's we, I think we figured it was like only what, like three or four we used for the actual meal yeah. yesterday. And besides the fact that they have the Black Death, there's nothing to really <laughs> worry about. And monkeypox, and, and monkey we're still pox. alive. We yeah, don't, you know, well, our, our lymph nodes aren't quite well, swollen. We got a yet, few but... days for the lymph nodes to swell. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's an important component of it. Is that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> While they are an incredible food, the prairie dogs can carry the plague, the, the actual plague that took out, you know, Europe. And that's kind of shocking when you first hear it. And uh, primarily, I think, due to the fleas that they'll, they'll have, which we encountered no fleas. No. They were clean. Very clean Very animals. Very clean animals. Yeah. And from what I understand, they're, you know, because they're, they have such a tight-knit social structure, their they're grooming of one another is probably why. But... But, you know, when we first came out, I remember, well, before we were coming out, I remember Lewis being like, you know, how are you going to deal with this Black Death thing? And like, yeah. he's like, hey, just so you know, I did a little research. You can't cook that away. Like, this is really serious. Um, and then, you know, our, 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 almost all of our friends, like uh, Tony C. Christ, you were saying, was like, hey, I feel like you guys aren't taking this too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing with Jared Holmes from our Austin, Texas episode. Uh, and he was like, you know, he's just like, he eats game. He he hunts buffalo and white te- tail and axis and muleys and he's just like and he he likes eating rattlesnake but he's like rattlesnake I'll, pizza he's like I'll I'll never eat a prairie dog so, <laughs> and I was like well are you afraid of the plague he's like it's the plague I'm not he's like they got it bad in Texas hmm. so and then you came the other day saying that on Joe Rogan's show they had mentioned that they could be a reservoir for monkeypox. Yeah, well. I think it's domestic prairie dogs, though. Who's got domestic? Never prairie heard dogs? of that. No, I somebody, zoos, messaged, sure. somebody messaged me who lives in Florida actually last night, and they were like, they sell them at my pet shop in Miami. Wow, interesting. And I was like, I think I've eaten a lot of things that are sold in that pet shop. At this point. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, what are you talking about? Like, well, pythons, iguanas. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, but but even, yeah, even, the, even the people around here though, every, everybody I told that we're going to do this, you know, like, Oh, they're just disgusted by the fact that we are going to be eating prairie dogs. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Davy's full turnaround. Yeah, 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 so yeah exactly. That's the best part. So our friend Davy, who who let us hunt on his land, I mean, he, he was just sort of laughing at us, like, yeah. you know, and he just had a prairie dog hunt there. It wasn't the, it wasn't the shooting of them. It was the idea that we were going to eat them. And then when we did our butchering, suddenly he shows up with he his family. He started quartered yeah. like yeah. little pieces of meat. Yeah, no, he got, it's like a chicken wing. He get, got more and more interested. Yeah, then he started he? to be like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, hmm. And then it was like, so Linda Black Elk's making the soup? <laughs> uh, and then it was like, well, I'd like to try that sometime. I don't know. And then it was, I'd like to try just the broth. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. you could bring me just the broth. And then he was like, you know what? I'm going to get you a container that he wrote on top of, like Davy's prairie dog right. broth or something he was like bring me back and then it, and then you know he just kept like upping the ante like he got more and more interested yeah and then when we finally brought it to him i mean yeah he dug in he dug in he was pleasantly surprised yeah. it started with like it's kind of weird and then it started like it's actually really good it's just that i know it's a prairie dog yeah, yeah. as he keeps eating it yeah, yeah he polished that little and then it turned into off. Wait, you have a little more in the truck? Uh, maybe I'll get some for my wife. <laughs> right? Yeah, that was a full that was a full turnaround. Awesome. Right? Three sixty for sure. I mean, to me, that sums up the whole point. One of the major reasons I wanted to make Wild Fed from the beginning was that was like one of the themes. Of, there's obviously times where we do episodes, and, and some of my favorite episodes are things that everybody knows is going to be good. Nobody's like buffalo burger that's not going to be good right you know everybody knows that's going to be good but we've done a lot of episodes on things that are like questionable and when when you see people have that turnaround it's like yeah mission success yeah 
But that said, uh, Linda and Luke's cooking was just awesome. It was great. It, the The meal was just phenomenal. And that was cool because they were camped out a couple hours away uh, for their annual family um, uh, Team Silla Harvest. Mm-hmm. So they've got a spot a couple hours out, outside of uh, Bismarck Mandan where they where they go every year, set up a camper at a campground, and then they go out all day and they, they harvest prairie turnips. And they cooked for us right there in their camp. And, yeah, uh, over the fire. It was great. Oh, it was incredible. And that soup, uh, well, both recipes, because there was a soup and then uh, Linda did more of like, what would you describe that she did? Braised braised parts, quartered parts. Yeah, yeah but kind, like of fried, yeah, kind of fried. Kind of fried with a fri- gravy. Yeah. 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 And, and she used the, the, they had found some oyster mushrooms right there in the campground. Anyway, the dishes were like almost all wild foods. And then they had a bunch of things jarred and canned that were like, wild foods or indigenous foods that have been given to them by other people. Like there was hickory oil from Sam Thayer, for instance, you know, just friends had given them. They had the uh, ramps that had come from Minnesota. Those chilies. Yeah. They had a, a, the chili that was the wild. I wish I could remember the name. Me too. I'll have to ask her. Chili yeah. Pekin. Is so that it? It? it may have been, but anyway, they, what she told me, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know all the details, but it sounded like this is a wild progenitor of most of the, most of the chilies that we eat today. So that was anyway. It was delicious. Yeah. Like so that. so let's talk about what were the ingredients in there real quick. There yeah. was the prairie dog, of course, um, the oyster mushrooms, the yep. team sila, yep. the ramps, the wild mushrooms that we harvested, and the wild onions. Or, excuse me, the wild onions. Yes. The yeah. Wild onions. So that I want to take a second on those too. There's a wild onion here. I think she said allium, something with textile, right? Allium textile. She called it. So it was an onion that a very small onion that had what looked almost like a woven cloth over the bulb that you'd have to peel away. But we were eating the onion itself, the onion tops, and the greens. The leaf, not the stem part, but the leaf. Yeah, like the we left the stem, part. which yep. she said is, is edible earlier in the year, but it was a little fibrous right now. Anyway, the whole plant was probably six inches tall. Very small onion, like smaller than a Vidalia. What a great onion flavor it had. Delicious. Yeah, and when we peeled all those out, like in her dish, there was lots of little onions sitting all in there. And man, they were they just looked so good, little jewels. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and then and then Luke had... Uh, I remember Luke was doing a lot of preparation on a cutting board that was um, an award he won at Sam Thayer's annual wild food gathering. Yeah, in 2020 best he cook. won. So yeah, I was like, yeah. all right, he knows what he's doing. Oh, yeah. Sam's a discerning... Uh, he's got a discerning palate. So... Anyway, he was a great cook, and man, they they just really pulled it off. Yeah, their son was helping and everything yeah. too. What's his name? Uh, Wawikia. Wawikia. Yeah, yeah, he was awesome. He made that tea that was. Uh, he had a little maple sugar and um, juniper, right? juniper yep. and he made a really nice tea. Yeah, and he, so picked, ma- he picked that right there. In the yeah, too. That he was, was awesome. like, he's like, it's a really simple recipe. You just need water and some of that tree over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was awesome. He was, and he dug, he dug right into the meal too. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember him chewing on because I like it to take with squirrels. You know, I take the hind legs, the fore legs, but then I take that mid section that's got the spine running through it, and it's the tenderloins and loins. And I remember at one point he's there just licking on like a spine. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he was like, I think he said, he's like, I think this is the spine. Yeah. <laughs> digging in. Yeah. yeah. He, now, he, he was it. seven years old. Is yeah, that right? Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have, I have a question. Cause now that we've had two, we've had two traditionally prepared meals. Loretta did cook something for us and now Linda, but they, they were both incredible meals, but they couldn't have been more different as far as flavor profiles. Yeah. And they both came from a place of like a historical tradition of, of this is how we made it. You know, Loretta was very simple, you know, said like, we don't use a ton of flavoring. It's salt and it's just the flavors of the, of the land. Right. Mm -hmm. That's when we had Buffalo. This one, um, tons of spices were coming in and, and, um, Linda was saying that, well, it's because, you know, all the tribes would trade with each other. And so they would have access to this. Um, are they, are those dishes coming from, from different tribes, different regions, different traditions? Like they're both incredible, but they're so different. I was just blown away by that. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good question. Definitely very extensive trade networks, you know, long time ago. Um, there would have been shells from the California coast, you know, the Pacific Northwest, um, the the Knife River Flint that is um, not too far from here, quarried here in the Dakotas, the only place I know that they have it, has been found all throughout, you know. So 
Um, yeah, the salt. I mean, they would have had access to different, you know, like the the, the little chilies we had for sure. You know, whether it was an abundance or it was just like um, occasional, that that's a great question. Yeah. But the the seasonings, what Linda and Luke were saying, like they were they were all indigenous. Yeah. You know, I, I think the only thing we figured out that didn't come from North America was the Himalayan salt mm-hmm. that they used, right? <laughs> yeah. But everything else was uh, sourced by you know her her uh, some of her friends and family you know throughout. And so I imagine, I can only imagine yeah. it would have been a similar long time ago too. And all stuff generally, I think, was pretty regional. Yeah. You know, pretty yeah. much from this. this Other than the area. chilies from the Southwest, yeah. I believe everything was, yeah, right here. In fact, Luke had even mentioned that this is probably the most traditional meal that's been eaten in this spot for se- yeah, in this several campground. hundred years. It's <laughs> so cool. Yeah. My read on it was, because uh, I felt like they, they made that dish, uh, the prairie dog dish, from a more contemporary palate perspective mm. where, you know, the culinary traditions, cause when I think about like modern culinary tradition, there's like, um, there's so much pomp there that comes from the fact that we have the time and the space to really think about like flavors. Like you'd think about putting music together or putting art together. And when I read the ethnographies, it sounds like a lot of Europeans are saying like this food was palatable, but it didn't have much salt or it didn't have much, like seasoning the way Europeans had gotten really used to because like French cuisine had reached these crazy highs and all of that. So I can't imagine the people were eating, like putting so much thought into flavors like yeah. we are today. Like we, I we, think, I think it wouldn't have been all a, a, a conglomerate of seasonings. Yeah, yeah. It would have been like, if we get salt this time, you know what yeah. I mean? Or bay leaves or whatever, the, whatever it would right. have been, you know, I'm yeah. sure. Oh yeah. Cause we had the California Bay in the dish yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Um, which Grant and I never made any jokes about, but we have a long standing thing. Cause Grant, the first foraged ingredient Grant ever brought to me, you had gone out to California to see a friend or something. Yeah, that's right. And you came back with the California out Bay. The San Bernardino mountains. And I was like, we were just getting to know each other. And I was like, I was like, what do you know about that? I was like, you're sure this is California Bay? Like, how sure are you? Like, I was, you know, we've developed a lot of trust since then, but like, I was like really skeptical, but they were great bay leaves actually. Mm-hmm. And they're so fragrant. So they had those. And then in addition to the chilies, that peppergrass went in there. Oh yeah. Pepper I can't grass. remember the species, but it's a relative of what I call shepherd's purse, what, yeah. what, um, which is a common uh, ingredient where I live. And um, there was just a bunch of sprigs of that went in too yep. that added some spicy flavor. It was delicious. Yep. A mustardy flavor. Yeah, very... Uh, I, f- I felt like, because I had said at one point, if I got this dish in a restaurant, I would I would be stoked about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it was very well done. It was a delicious, yeah. delicious meal. Anybody who would have just saw it, they would have dug in and not even questioned what the meat was. Yeah. Yep, agreed. Yeah. Um, and to eat it in the context of just surrounded by their family, kids yeah. running around, grandma's there. Like yeah. it was a good environment. To yeah, it was fun. What'd you think of the meat, Oliver? I thought it was great. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I thought it was, you know, it didn't have that, like that game, that game yeah. flavor that like my palate isn't quite adjusted to right. yet. Like it was just delicious. Yeah, you just thought right. it was neutral, like chicken. It was, I mean, it, a little bit more red, though. It had a, a more, more of a red, yeah. a little darker meat. Um, but uh, the the flavoring of the, of the stew, I thought, was was just so so complex that mm-hmm. it it just sort of blended in right mm-hmm. right with it. Yeah. And and the prairie turnips were were really excellent. This go around for me, I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was digging them. I was looking yeah. the plate. You yeah. made the point um, to Oliver that these prairie turnips were freshly harvested versus the ones we had with Loretta also had come off of a braid. So they yeah. were older. So they were, they, yeah, they were dried. Maybe a little preserved, tougher yeah. and stuff too. Yeah. I'm just craving microwaved golf balls. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I have. Foamy some. microwave <laughs> yeah. golf balls. And then, uh, so Daniel also brought wild blueberries from Maine yeah. to Linda there. Yeah. And then, so we, we did our own little wool joppy dessert that i'd was... like to just give a couple of pro tips to the audience here because uh, linda i had said to her you know as i'll often do when we go to do something like this like hey is there something i can bring for you and she was like blueberries and i was like yes and in my head i was like how am i gonna do that so i got frozen blueberries and then i wrapped them in i put them in a ziploc and i put a bunch of uh then i wrapped like squeeze the air out then i put that in another ziploc surrounded by paper towels so if it started to leak because then I put that in another couple of bags, and that went stuffed in in all my clothes. So it's like if this thing melts and breaks, then my clothes are all going to be blue, you know. Uh, but with all your clothes around there, you think your suitcase basically becomes like a Yeti cooler, you know, like all that insulation. 
yeah. around that. Fr- and when we got here, they weren't frozen, but they were because st- we had three flights to get out here from Portland. But they were still cold. And then I had to freeze them again. And then by the time I brought her, you know, like all the juice, when they melted, all the juice was out. But it made great wojabi. Yeah, it was. And they use, like, I believe, a little bit of maple maple syrup. syrup. Or sugar, From the box it? elders out here. Okay. So yeah. more caramelized. Box, out, box elder sugar, sugar. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, that everything was just delicious. Remind me, what, what goes into wojapi? What's the recipe? Because we... It's, pretty, pretty much just berries and water. You uh, simmer it to... It gets, and that's where we were talking about the um, prairie turnip. You can make it into a little flour as a little thickening agent to kind of help get it yeah, a little when, bit thicker. But, when Loretta made it, she did some cornstarch. Yeah. Yeah. And then for... And, when we did it yesterday, it was pretty much just water and berries and then the, the uh, sugar. And the wood smoke had gotten in there a little yeah. bit, oh, too. Yeah, it was which delicious. Was nice. yeah. Yeah. It was so good. Little pieces of ash actually got yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. It, was all, it was all great. The uh, the uh, Dakota name for the prairie dogs is... Uh, Peace Pizza. Peace Pizza, yeah. yeah, yeah so. pe- pizza Pizza. pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Peace Pizza kind of sounds like Pizza Pizza. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. You want to say what that means, by the way? So, well, the word Pizza means kind of like a squeal or a squeak you know and so uh that's just the way they describe the animals so mm-hmm. so b might be that kind of like plural part that to that it means kind of like the community if you will so yeah. Bees, bees, uh, yeah. yeah so all there's kind of like it really literally means those that squeak you know? yeah oh, and that's man. a little barking so and i was kind of joking um when we went hunting sunday when i laid down to go to sleep that night that's all i heard was those <laughs> prairie dogs barking I, like like it, it, when I laid down to go to bed, I just could not get get that. It, it, and it was coming from inside my house, right? So whatever noise I was hearing, it's like that's a prey. It sounds like a prey dog. <laughs> yeah, dude, I think hunting them was about one of the funnest hunts. I'm I'm a huge fan of squirrel hunting, and I've said many times to Grant, like like, and I think I might have said in in an episode of the, no, I said in the in the Brook episode. episode. Yeah, like like my retirement plan is like I want astronomy. This is a huge interest of mine that I've had to back burner because I got too much going on, but I really love looking at the stars and, uh, that and like brook trout fishing, which is just like these little tiny little trout in the mountains for me anyway, the fish that I go after and then squirrel hunting. Like those, those things could occupy me as an old man, I think. And they're really low intensity, you know, for your body and everything. Um, but if I was out here, I'd be flipping the switch right to prairie dogs. It's like the same kind of an experience, you know? And just you soul out on the landscape, like picking off a few and having a meal with them occasionally just seems like about as fun as anything you could do. And I mean, yeah, I that just, was, it was super fun. I'm going to remember it really fondly. Yeah, you know? it was, it was a great hunt. It was super fun. Yeah. It's a highlight for me, man. I'll be thinking about them for a long time and, and I'm also going to get a 17 HMR when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a really cool, man. I got that one headshot at 188 yards. I can't even believe that. I think awesome. Desi or, or, um, Davey said he's having a hard time finding the ammo, though. Is that yeah, right? yeah. you saying out here, though. Out here, okay. Yeah, I'll see if it's available. You think Nick's got a 17 HMR Nick can Northeast get me one. Firearms? I would get a Volkortsen in a Magpul stock. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit of a cheek riser. You've, you've already been looking at it. I them. have been looking yes. all weekend, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, but anyway, no, I really like this type of hunting. And, and as much as I love to take a big game animal, it's such a huge investment of energy and time. It's like... You get the deer on the ground, and then it's like, all right, now I've got a lot of work ahead of me. When and we took that, when we took that buffalo last year, that was a lot of work. I can't even begin to. I mean, that's the most work I've ever had to do to, for me, you know. So I love that, but that's like a huge investment, and it's not like a thing you could do on your lunch break, mm-hmm. like you could with this. Right. You know what I mean? So, so to me, out here, I just think, I just hope that some people are inspired. I hope so too, because there's a, a tremendous resource. I think I think we got we got a fan in Davey now. Yeah, I think he'll, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he uh, his three sixty. The way his sister was just so grossed out by, oh my god, you're gonna go hunt. When and when she saw the meat, she still couldn't. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it looked like any other meat. You know yeah. what I mean? It just they just they know where it comes yeah. from, and they just they just grew up with this. It's a uh, disgusting little yeah, creature. Yeah, and maybe you there's know. a thing of like you don't want to you would be embarrassed if anyone knew or like, you know, you don't want anyone to I'd, hear about it. I'd yeah. say just make sure that you know, the town you're hunting isn't being poisoned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's and look it, like both North Dakota and South Dakota have, um, on their websites for their uh, game departments, um, images that you can see of what they look like if they have 
uh, Plague, or whatever. And, and Travis, you made a great point. You were like, man, if Plague was ripping through here, you wouldn't see a lot of young. There'd be a lot less prairie dogs out. Like, if you're seeing a thriving, healthy population, that's probably a good indicator that there's not a plague moving through. But, but also, there was um, under the hides, like you could see a lot of broken blood vessels in the hide if they were sick, and then the organs were spotted and all of that. So, obviously, you'd want to educate yourself up about that. But, uh, but that seems to me like it's like chicken. Oh, salmonella. Right. This yeah, is a little bit of, oh, little bit of fear. Yeah. It's, a, a, bit good, of fear it's a good headline though. Right? Yeah. It's right. a great you know, headline. Like the, yeah. Bubonic plague. Like yeah. That, it yeah. got my attention for sure. sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I am very focused on this right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, anyway, this has been a great time. And, uh, Travis, thank you so much. I know that, uh, you're, the Sundance is about to kick off. Here, yeah, right? yeah, so our annual Sundance here. Today's so. a today's a big day, so we'll get yeah, you today's back tree out day. There. So we're looking forward to going down there and uh, celebrating the renewal of life. Yeah, man. So Beautiful. it'll be good. Well, thank you for hosting us out here oh, for another you. really great time, and thank you for being such a fantastic talent in yeah. the show too. And then know? you know, I know they're not here, but thank you to Luke and Linda for cooking us oh, an amazing just, meal. Yeah. They were just amazing. Yeah, yeah, really incredible. And their and their their little boy who was definitely he's got a a future in uh, filming or television or something. I guess. Watch out, Daniel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh man, but he's like yeah. he's talent and direction. I mean, yeah, he was yeah. doing the whole game. Yeah. He knew exactly that when he looked at you and was like, he's like, that was good, but but should we do it again? <laughs> I was like, wow, man, this guy Honestly. knows what he's, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the meal was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah we learned. Was, I learned so much just walking yeah. around the landscape with them for an hour two yeah. hours yeah. identifying food that, yeah the you know, foraging was, was fun the yeah. spot was beautiful yeah you know and we, in, in in a matter of time we got you know enough uh prey turnips for like what a two two and a half foot braid yeah you know yeah and uh when you and, when you all work together as a community like that you can get make things happen pretty yeah. fast yeah so yeah big thanks to both of them and also um to Candace, I don't yeah. know something just sitting there peeling prairie turnips with an elder here was just like yeah, it was amazing and yeah. we didn't speak much but I just felt like it just was really beautiful. you didn't need to right didn't need right. to right. Yeah. yeah so yeah big thanks to the Black Elks for their help and uh, I'll go to your wife Travis yeah yeah, yeah. 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 thank you Desi you again that's it yeah. Desi I love, I love you holding Desi. down the fort and all those five kids while yeah. we pulled Travis away for a week <laughs> <laughs> yeah much thanks to my wife we'll peel a tonka yeah and uh, big thanks to Oliver who uh, doesn't get enough credit on this show for all the incredible production and camera work that he does oh, it's a blast yeah. Oliver's this is a, this is a fantasy show <laughs> Oliver's great yeah, yeah. yeah. on well, I can't wait for people to see the episode. Yeah, so they they can expect that probably around the first of the year, sometime yeah. uh, 2023, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, best things are worth waiting for, yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, we're we're trying to make just an even better third season. Yeah, and we've got a great schedule coming up. So, I, uh, but I can't wait for people to watch this. Yeah, go on this hunt with us. Wopila, yeah, Wopila, Wopila, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.